name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller. I'm blessed to serve St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, St. Luke's Covington, and Trinity St. John Lutheran School, Nashville. Thank you for the opportunity to spend this time with you in God's Word. If you're sitting at home, you may want to have your Bible ready. If you're driving, please keep your eyes on the road and listen along as we continue our study of the Gospel of Jesus according to St. Luke. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us to forsake all trust in earthly gain and to find in you our heavenly treasure. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Last week, we studied two important sections in Luke 18, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, and the account of Jesus welcoming and blessing the little children, even infants. When we, like the tax collector, come before God like a little child, yes, even like an infant, receiving everything from God as a gift, then we are justified. We are counted righteous before God. We continue with Luke 18, beginning at verse 18. We'll read all the way to verse 27 and then go back and talk about the various sections. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. We have three reports on this event, recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew tells us that he was a young man, Matthew 19. Luke tells us he was a ruler of some sort, perhaps an official in one of the local synagogues. All three accounts tell us that he had great possessions, or as Luke puts it, he was extremely rich. So putting all three together, he has come to be called the rich young ruler. And how much do you think he was worth in today's dollars? A million? Ten million? A billion? We just don't know. One thing we can be sure of is this. Jesus' message to the young man is fitting for all of us. No matter how many dollars we are or are not worth, no matter what our age, he asks Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I believe he was sincere in his question. Mark tells us that he ran up to Jesus as Jesus was setting out on the road. He knelt before Jesus and asked a question. Even though he may be a Pharisee, it doesn't appear that he's trying to test Jesus or trip him up as happened so often. Jesus answers, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, some want to say that here Jesus was denying that he's God. But Jesus' customary way of speaking with people was to talk to them in such a way as to get them to think, to cause them to turn his words over and over in their minds. It's as if Jesus is saying, I'm really more than just a teacher. I want you to come to realize that I am, in fact, God in the flesh, the one and only one who is truly good, the source of all goodness. Jesus was not denying that he was God, but was emphasizing the absolute goodness and holiness of God. The God from whom you want eternal life is, in fact, perfect, holy, altogether righteous. Are you sure you want to come before him with things that you have done in order to earn eternal life? 
Yes, the man uses the word inherit, but he might as well have said merit. What must I do to merit or to earn eternal life? That's what his mindset was. How should Jesus respond? Is the man ready to hear the law or to hear the gospel? Well, one of the marks of a good doctor is that he or she knows what the patient needs at any particular time. Sometimes a doctor may prescribe something that will relieve your pain and make you comfortable. At other times, the good doctor may have to prescribe something that is difficult and painful at first, but will bring you relief in the long run. Maybe it's a surgery you need or some nasty medicine you need to take or a painful treatment in order to get rid of what's harming your system or even poisoning you. Jesus knows the self-righteous attitude of the man's heart, and he knows that needs to be treated. So he applies a dose of the law. He says to the man, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. So Jesus directs the man to five of the Ten Commandments, and each of these five has to do with loving our neighbor. And how does the young ruler respond? He says, all these I have kept from my youth. Whoa, if we give these commandments any thought at all, we surely cannot answer like this young man. We have failed in words, if not in deeds, and in thoughts, if not in words. 1 John 1 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then it promises, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this man wants to confess nothing. Apparently he's been taught by the Pharisees that as long as he has not killed someone, he's not guilty of murder. Never mind any anger or hatred in his heart. As long as he's not had an affair, he was not guilty of adultery. Forget about the lust in his heart, and so on. He must not have heard Jesus' teachings elsewhere about the real meaning of the law of God. If reflecting on these commandments does not bring us to recognize our sins, then we have to hear what Jesus went on to say. Like a good doctor, Jesus gives him a second dose. This is stronger medicine intending to bring about his eternal well-being. He tested the man with a special command. And Mark adds that Jesus looked at him and loved him as he said this. He said, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus was driving the man back to the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. Jesus wanted him to test and see if he feared, loved, and trusted in God above all things, even his great wealth. For the time being, he failed the test. He loved his wealth more. It says, when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. You see, God requires that we love him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. But this man's heart was still stuck on his stuff, on his land, his holdings, maybe even his household goods. That's where his affection was. That's what he depended upon when troubles came to him. Jesus' command here would be very much like Jesus coming to you today and saying, Sell the farm. Sell all your equipment all your buildings, all your vehicles, everything that has your name on it, get rid of it. Turn it all into cash and give the cash away to Christian ministries that are set up to help the poor. That would be a shocking command, would it not? Well, the man was shocked, wasn't he? And we read in Mark that he went away disheartened and sorrowful. You and I, unlike the apostles and this young man, have no such special command to leave all our possessions and the people we know and love. Quite the opposite. God wants us to stay and do our duty. But he wants our hearts just as much as he wanted the heart of that young man. This teaches us to ask, to what is my heart attached above all? Christ wants us to be ready on a moment's notice to give up everything and anything for him. 
Remember the test God gave Abraham. He told him to take his one and only dear son for whom he had waited and waited and waited, his beloved son Isaac, the child of promise, and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. In the end, God stopped Abraham from harming Isaac, but only after Abraham showed he really did love God more. Genesis 22. So what if Jesus did say, sell the farm, give the money to the poor, go to the seminary, become a pastor or deaconess? Would you do it? Jesus isn't suggesting that we return to the practices of the Middle Ages when people were encouraged to take a, a vow of poverty and a vow never to get married. Many of them left their homes and lived in monasteries and nunneries. They thought that this would make them better people, more pleasing to God. But it was a bunch of foolishness that caused all sorts of problems. But what about other challenges from Jesus? What if he said, you have a dear spouse, but I love you even more than your spouse does. To draw you closer to myself, I'm going to take your spouse home to heaven with me and have you live for a time without him or her. What if he said, I have given you a great mind and many intellectual gifts, but before you die, I'm going to have you live for a time with Alzheimer's. You'll need to live for a time like a little child again. Trust in me and no one else. Or you have spent much time in your life caring for others. You have done this well and have taken great pride in it, but for a time before you die, others will have to care for you. Thereby, I am teaching you to receive kindness and love as a gift. It will make you more ready to receive salvation as a gift. Or you have gotten far in life because of your athletic ability and physical strength. When you suffer an injury, you will learn to put your trust elsewhere. Your body will betray you. I alone am worthy of your trust. Is there something or someone that we love more than we love God? What if he would cause us to have to live without it or without him or her? Jesus said, whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Are you ready? Am I ready to give up everything rather than lose our faith? Are we ready to say goodbye to everything rather than lose our salvation in the hope of eternal life? If there's a lack of willingness to say goodbye to the things we have, if there's a clinging to other people more than to Christ, then we've not passed that first commandment test. You shall have no other gods. Well, this message brings to mind a Lenten hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let's hear it sung by the ongoing ambassadors for Christ. So what became of the rich young ruler? We don't know. I'd like to think that after some time, this man was brought to faith in Jesus and did become one of his followers. Remember, Mark added that remark that Jesus looked at him and loved him, even as he applied that strong dose of the law. 
So some have wondered if perhaps this rich young ruler was perhaps Mark himself. Well, after watching the man walk away in sadness, Jesus has more to say about eternal life and riches. Luke 18, verses 24 to 27. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Note, when Jesus says how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, he literally says how difficult it is for those who have possessions to enter the kingdom of God. That would be all of us. His message is that with man, with human beings, salvation is impossible. There's no possibility for us to make a way for ourselves into his kingdom. God is so good, so absolutely good, in fact, that not one of us can measure up to his entrance requirements. Once we find sin in ourselves, we cannot claim we have kept God's law. Now we see why Jesus says, For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And there's really no other way to take this statement from Jesus than to take it literally. He's referring to the largest animal in that land at that time and the smallest opening. It won't work. It's impossible. Even so, it's impossible for anyone who has possessions to be saved. In other words, we are all condemned under God's law. This text has done its work on us if it brings us to realize, whether we are rich or poor, that we have broken God's commandments and therefore have nothing with which to do business before God. Because of our sin, we have no currency that God accepts, no checkbook he recognizes, nothing with which to barter. We are in utter poverty. We can try to spend our good works to get salvation from God and the forgiveness of sins, but we will find that it has failed would be as though we went to bed one night and someone changed everyone else's money while we were asleep so that in the morning our money was no longer any good. We're going to deal with God on the basis of what we deserve, of what we have coming, what we have earned. Our total bankruptcy will land us straight in the torments of hell. No wonder we confess that we are poor, miserable sinners. No wonder King David, one of the wealthiest men the world has ever known, cries out several times in the Psalms, I am poor and needy. Why is he so poor? He explains in one of those Psalms, My sins have overtaken me. They are more than the hairs of my head. Psalm 40. To present our life, our good works, or anything that came from within us to God, as a payment for his goodness would be like trying to buy a car with play money. It won't work. As Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But the good news today is that God does and has done the impossible. All things are possible with God. Yes, even our entrance into the kingdom of God. God supplied what we don't have. God himself supplied the only kind of payment acceptable to bring anyone into the kingdom. The only life that did measure up was the life of the God-man, Jesus, and that life was lived in our place. This rich young man was in fact speaking to the only one who was perfectly good, the only one who truly had kept all the commandments since he was a boy. As true man, he could be our substitute. As true God, he could and did keep the law perfectly. He did not murder nor did he entertain murderous or hateful thoughts, even when they killed him unjustly. He did not commit adultery, keeping himself pure 100%, even as a single man. He did not steal. He did not give false testimony, did not defraud. He honored his father and mother. God in Christ did the impossible. He kept the law. And when Jesus died on the cross, he made payment to God for the sins of the world in currency that was totally acceptable to the Father. 
And the Father demonstrated that when he raised Christ from the dead. Christ has redeemed us, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. The precious blood of God's own Son was needed to open heaven for us, and God freely spent it on us. God does the impossible. Full payment for our guilt was made without any of us having to go to hell. Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the riches and the treasures of his righteousness and forgiveness. God the Holy Spirit has used the power of the gospel to take our hearts, formerly so closely attached to things, and attached our hearts to God. The good news of Jesus is such good news, so sweet, so refreshing, that it creates in us the love of God and the trust in him which Christ commands. What was impossible for us to do by keeping the law is the very thing God has done for us by sending his own son. Christ made available to this rich young man and to you and me the free gift of an inheritance in heaven, a true inheritance, a gift that comes to us because of what was in the heart of the one who has bequeathed it to us through Christ. Imagine sinners in the eternal home of the Holy God. God does the impossible. What an inheritance. Our sinful nature would lead us to believe that to give up our attachment to an earthly inheritance for a heavenly one would be foolish. It would mean taking a loss. Actually, when the joys and riches of heaven are ours, there can be no talk of loss. In eternal life, there'll be no regrets about having put aside love of possessions here on earth. You and I are going to see Jesus face to face. We're going to a place where there'll be no more tears, no more pain, no more sin, no more death. Best of all, it really is a gift. It is not a matter of what must I do to inherit eternal life, but rather what has God done that I may inherit eternal life? And the answer is he has done everything. He has done the impossible. I'd like to close with some remarks from Dr. Jeff Gibbs in his commentary on Matthew. Here are some things he has to say when he writes about this account in Matthew 19. He says, what then does Jesus mean when he speaks about camels and impossibly small openings and of the difficulty of a rich person being saved? On the one hand, we should not regard Jesus' demand that the young man sell all his possessions and give everything to the poor as a general requirement for discipleship. Even in the case of the disciples who immediately left their daily tasks behind when Jesus called them, these men did not divest themselves of all their possessions. Peter still had a house in which Jesus healed his ailing mother-in-law. Presumably, some of Jesus' disciples still owned the boats in which Jesus traveled. At the same time, we cannot ignore the fact that Jesus turns to his disciples in order to teach in a more general way about the spiritual dangers of wealth. In the first place, Wealth can quickly become fuel poured on the fire of our appetites and lusts. Desire all too quickly seeks gratification, but when it finds gratification, it does not rest. What once were unnecessary luxuries quickly become needs, and needs begin to control our time and energy and commitment. I suspect that this is a universal tendency among fallen human creatures. What is certain is that 21st century North American culture aggressively caters to and panders after our appetites in every conceivable way, and this is spiritually dangerous. Wealth is spiritually perilous because it increases the ability to indulge the natural preoccupation with self, so that life becomes service to the God of self in the never-ending urge to gratify one's sinful desires. In the second place, wealth is dangerous because it brings a certain kind of power. The power of wealth can deceive me into thinking in idolatrous ways that I am autonomous, in control of my own life, and I have the right, since I have the ability, to manipulate the lives of others. The power of wealth can deceive Christians into thinking that their opinions and their stations in life and even in the church are more important or significant than those opinions and positions actually are. 
Wealth brings power, and power is a volatile and potentially deadly commodity. Even if the power of wealth does not succeed in leading me to fall away from Christ into unbelief, it can lead me into unfruitful and selfish choices in ways that abuse the people around me rather than serving them in Christ-like humility. So what are disciples of Jesus to do? The most obvious answer would be to take a goodly share of the wealth that I might possess and give it away so that I no longer possess it. Let it go. Release it out into the church and into the world and enable others to benefit and do good with it. Although we cannot and should not take Jesus' specific words to the rich young man as a general command to sell all our possessions and give everything to the poor, we can reflect the spirit of his teaching in our own lives as stewards. There's no reason why I need to fuel my appetites as I desire. Why does it even seem unusual to suggest that if one's wealth increases over time, one's standard of living should remain essentially the same, while the percentage of wealth that leaves one's hands and goes out to bless others should steadily rise? Why could we not all have as our goal to live on a smaller and smaller percentage of our wages? If it all stays with me, clutched in my sinful hands, it can do terrible damage to me and the people around me. As one who knows himself to be like a child, I can be taught to delight in God's mercy in Christ, to embrace my identity as just one sinful but redeemed disciple of Jesus in the company of others, and to respond in generosity to others in need. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by the children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we continue our study of the gospel according to Luke. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's where the treasures of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are freely given out every Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We thank our sponsors and we thank our faithful partners at V1047 and thank you for listening.